And the little recording button is activated. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone out there. It is Club Muffet Talks for October of 2022. And it's October! It's Halloween time for the third year in a row. What do we call these? Our Halloween Spectaculars? Spooktacular. Uh, spooktacular. Fantastic. Uh, by the way, there's like 5 billion people out there on YouTube who use the term spooktacular when the yeah. October rolls around. Yeah. I never once called myself an original person. I just. <laughs> so I'm Chris. Uh, I'm Ryan. You all know, instruction librarian. I'm Joe. I'm also an instruction librarian here at Moffitt. Oh, am I supposed to say what I do? If you want to. Ideally. I don't care. I don't know. I don't do anything really. I just sit in my office all day long. Okay. Um, we also have a guest today. We have Kate Morgan with us uh, today. Kate, would you like to say who you are and why it's important we have you here? Hi, I'm Kate. I am a MSU student. I major in computer science, and I'm also the president of the gaming club on campus. And uh, Chris asked me on to come and talk about one of the events that we're holding on October 21st in the library. So. This will be our second year doing it. We're calling it, um, well, I remember at first we were calling it Halloween Horror Night, but then we changed it to uh, Tabletop Terror. Yeah. <clears throat> it was going to be alliterative anyway, but you know that one, that one gives it a bit more um, specificity, I think. Yeah. Let's people know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Only tabletop games. We're not doing uh, other types of things. But yeah, that was... Well, I think we had a pretty good uh, template last year for how we did our uh, our horror night. Hopefully this year it won't be me standing in the back, twiddling my thumbs, scared out of my mind to actually get the thing going. <laughs> yeah, this year I actually know what I'm doing also, so <laughs> I'll be able to help. So this is the second year of the gaming club, or officially like the beginning of the second year of the gaming club being a, a real big organization on campus. Is that correct? Yeah, we started last year and uh, very small, and now we're over 300 members. So wow, it's definitely grown. That's crazy. That, I mean, that's really awesome. Like I, I've heard from some other people in, in other organizations. I don't want to say by name because like I, I don't want to embarrass them or, or whatever. But or I've heard like the the faculty involved with them will say like we can't like we we have a couple dozen members, but we can't get like a handful to come to meetings or, or organize events. And whenever I see the gaming club doing anything, it's like it's just huge turnout and a bunch of, of really uh, like it's just a lot of excitement and it's it's just so awesome to see that coming together so quickly yeah i honestly didn't expect it to get as big as it did as quick as it did Games but i'm really huge. glad it did well and... a few things uh, i want to mention before we get started uh there is the event we're having on the 21st but i think we need to mention a group of people that showed up last year that we do not want showing up this year oh, it, this yeah. is not an event for children this is an event for um current students um, there are there are state and federal regulations about who can actually hold events for small children on a university campus, and unfortunately, none of us actually meet those criteria. You actually have to go through training to to do something like that. And so, if you're looking for something fun for your kids to do for Halloween, this is not the event for them. This is this is an event for the uh, students here on campus. Yeah, the children. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kate. I was just gonna say it. It sounds like something that kids could have fun with, but unfortunately, we'd all have to go through like a specific training to be able to host it for kids, and we just don't have the time to do that. Yeah, and some of the games that we have also are like, they're really slow, and not like, well, they're not slow, but they're like really, really long. Like, I remember one of the yeah. games that we did last year took the entire night to finish, and we got out at like midnight. Well, I, I think we should have a Cards Against Humanity uh, thing for six-year-olds. That's what I think. Again, <laughs> some of them are not going to be necessarily appropriate for children either. You know, they actually have like like child-oriented versions of those. It's like do they really? Of course, it's they like do. Yeah. it's like a picture do. of like a face or something. It's like, what's the person? Why are they, they making this face? 
They also have Bad Apples, which is basically cards against humanity, but without any of the profanity or <laughs> uh, inappropriate topics. The fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so um, I, I guess just to just to get it out of the way, just because we do this in every episode, what's everyone doing? What's what are we all having fun with recently? Well, I saw talking about Halloween. I saw Werewolf uh, by Night by um, uh, by uh, the Marvel Group again. They put out a, a with something new. It's a special. It's not a movie. It's not a TV series. It's a special in like the old ABC specials or CBS specials. They did Werewolf by Night, which was sort of a take on the 1971 film, The Beast Must Die, as well as having nods to the classic Universal films and Hammer Horror films. I liked it a lot. It was a lot of fun. I liked it. Um, there's a, an actress that's in that, the, the actress that played Elsa, and I'm not looking at it, so I'm going to get it wrong. I think the actress's name is... Adina Menzel? Or, Lauren Lauren Donnelly, what? I think that's the name. So it's, uh, uh, but she's uh, the thing that I most recently know her from is the TV series The Nevers, which is also fun. I haven't done, I haven't watched anything on TV in a while. I've just been playing uh, Overwatch Two recently since that came out. I've been having a lot of fun now that the servers have actually stabilized and I'm able to play it. I had a hard, hard crash last night, like oh, like really? right in the middle, like right as the like the counter for like whatever the match was went over to my side, like my team was starting to win. Hard crash and like I had to log back in and everything. It was huh. <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> stable, but uh well it's play. better than it has been. <laughs> Yeah. Have you had any of like super crazy long queues? Yes. Uh I went to the gaming lounge on campus to play with a few friends and we had an 8000 person queue. And we decided to play something else after that. <laughs> uh I had a 20,000 on my first night and I was like I'm going to feed my child and I'll come back to this later. And when I came back, it was 5,000 people in queue. And I was like, all right, cool. That, that took 15 minutes. It got down to a, a fourth. So, okay. Yeah. I didn't even try and get on within like the first four or five days just because I knew it would be insane. So I know that <clears throat> um, our varsity team, that's one of our big games is Overwatch. Has anything changed or has there been like any kind of problem getting that changed over since like Overwatch 2 kind of took it over? Because I know like even when you play it on Discord, like the now playing tab still just says Overwatch and it has the original logo. Like they didn't yeah. change anything. Like it's the same game kind of. I'm not sure, honestly. I know that... Uh... Some of them were complaining about the queues because they wanted to get in and practice for an upcoming match. But other than that, I haven't heard too much about it. But it's also not really my area of specialty. Mm -hmm. So I don't keep up with it too much. That's fair. <clears throat> uh, I've been doing the same. I've been playing Overwatch. I've been playing the new Gundam Overwatch as well. It's called Gundam Evolution. It's basically the same, just a smaller roster and um it's not quite as fun as overwatch i don't think like it feels kind of kind of janky but you're in giant robots and there are, there well, are also giant... because chris deep in it must do all things gundam i uh, no, i adore gundam um the <laughs> new gundam just started airing last week and i am like 99 percent positive that it is a gundam take on shakespeare's the tempest there are very very big like hints and there's a there's a woman named prospera whose daughter is uh in control of a war machine called the aerial um it, there are a lot of uh, other things but it's like as soon as i say those things it's like this is this is the tempest right yeah, uh, i've been watching tempest. Yeah, it's the Tempest. I've I've been, I've just just been watching a whole lot of anime. Uh, Chainsaw Chainsaw Man started today. It's wonderful and glorious. I'm so happy. 
Um, other than that, though, it was just baby stuff, and um, which I I did want to ask Joe. Uh, Joe, what's the longest you ever listened to either of your children cry before uh, you wanted to, to to call yourself the worst parent ever? Uh, let's see how how long how old were they? Um, <laughs> uh, the uh. crying crying when you know that the child is okay and that's that's the thing you have to verify you have to verify that the child is actually okay that there's not a need for a diaper change that there's no obvious pain thing not obviously hungry anything like that Sometimes your child just wants to be held. Uh, and it is frustrating, of course, to hold your child and your child be crying and you seem completely unable to comfort, to provide comfort. Um, that's, that's terribly frustrating. Uh, when you know, when you know that your child is actually crying due to exhaustion, and you know that at some point they're just going to pass out. When you know that, then you can go, all right, I'm going to just let you cry. And then it can be virtually any amount of time. You know, it's like you, you prop a pillow up outside of the crib. You have your hand through the bars of the crib <laughs> with your hand on the child. The child is crying. You're crying on the inside, and eventually one or both of you passes out. Okay, well, that's. I'm glad that that's not just... Um, the thing is, is that our doctor told us we need to start putting our daughter in her room, in her crib, only go in there if, like, if we just can't stand to hear her cry and, like, touch her, but don't make eye contact, and then leave right away, which I feel like would make it worse, but... uh she was like, it's going to feel like your heart's being wrenched out, but it'll be for, for her benefit if you just, just let her cry until she goes to sleep. So we did that last night, and we were sitting in the living room like, okay, let's watch the new House of Dragon thing and just for, just forget about her. Just let her let her sleep, whatever. We have a... I showed YouTube before we started, but I have a, um, a nanny cam, basically, and I was just... We were just sitting there watching our show she started crying as soon as we put it on and just to make sure she was okay we put on our our camera so the first 40 minutes or so of watching this show which last night's episode was or i guess last sunday's episode was like one of the hardest to watch that they've ever made in any of these game of thrones shows and we're sitting there watching it with our phones held up the whole time just like <laughs> for audio listeners it was a very terrible experience um but eventually she went to sleep and she slept through the whole night for the first time in like five months. So it was worth it, but it felt like someone was digging into my heart and making me die. But I got uh, eight and a half hours of sleep last night. So that's awesome. Yeah, uh, we we have not been watching the, the dragon thing at all. Uh, because it's Halloween, I decided I'd watch some some bloody things over the weekend. I watched the movie From Hell, which is the Jack the Ripper story with like Johnny Depp and Heather Graham. And I watched the uh, bloody samurai movie, Blade of the Immortal. Uh, but the most horrifying thing that I watched over the weekend that just filled me with dread and, and, and confusion and it just, uh, just tore me up uh, was the most recent episode of the uh, British Bake Off. Where they oh did, yeah where they did mexican week and watching british people make their version of what they think mexican food is was just i uh, 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 yeah <laughs> so my my name is my last name is you can see it in the box here it's pronounced Deepanetta, but at some point it was uh, Depineta. 
Spanish or Mexican or some type of name. I think my paternal grandfather might have been from Mexico or something. I never met the guy. I don't know. Those clips made me like have you have either have any of you heard the term emotional damage? Oh, yeah. Psychological damage. That's yeah. what that was to me. That hurt. Those clips are like stuck in my head now. I've been we my wife and I make a lot of like we make a lot of burritos and like street tacos mm-hmm. and stuff just at home. And we've been saying guacamole now for like the last week because that's the British are no longer allowed to make Mexican food. I'm going to mm-hmm. say that right now. I'm I've never used my cultural privilege before. Stop. <laughs> You're cut off. Yeah. yeah. Oh. By the way, Kate, this is the usual chaos we go through on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you've been around every like for a little bit. You've been around us. You you should yeah. know a little bit about what we're like here. Uh, th- this is basically what I expected. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Oh. So, Joe, you want to talk about uh, just what's going on just around the area? Sure. For a bit? Um, we have actually more things coming up. Uh, coming up like toward the end of the month and like in the first part of November. And I'll talk about that later. As far as things that are going on right now uh, or things that you should jump on right now or just ongoing things, uh, two things in local community theater, uh, Wichita Theater and Backdoor Theater are both doing uh, October Halloween kinds of productions. Uh, Wichita Theater is doing Clue the Musical um, and you can contact their box office, 940-723-9037. And Backdoor Theater is doing the mystery thriller, Wait Until Dark. Uh, you can call them at 322-5000. And then there's some, some kind of ongoing things is that uh, the Wichita Falls Public Library is still doing story time Thursday mornings uh, at 1030. And uh, Wichita Falls Brewing Company is doing live trivia Thursday nights at seven. Uh, but that's pretty much it for things you need to jump on now. Well, Ryan and I have actually a, um, we have a bit of a tradition here for, for these Halloween episodes and we've already done them. We got them out of the way. We're not doing them anymore. But for Kate and Joe, I want to ask, what are some of your favorite horror movies or books video games what what have you just some of your favorite horror titles oh goodness i don't even know <laughs> um movies wise my all-time favorite is probably gremlins and that's mainly just because uh i grew up watching it with my dad like every halloween and then sometimes every christmas too because yeah, that's what I was about to say. Funny. That's a Christmas movie. Yeah, <laughs> that and Krampus. I put Krampus now at like almost the same level of Gremlins. Those two are like they're perfect Halloween slash Christmas movies. And when people say Nightmare Before Christmas, it's like no, 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 no. Let's we have better examples than that. That's a good one, but let's check yeah. these out. And then. But, <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, for anyone uh, listening to the audio version of this, uh, all three of us old dudes nodded at the exact same time when you said Gremlins. <laughs> so. uh, I mainly play a lot of horror games, and recently I've been playing a lot of a game called Phasmophobia. Mm. It's basically a uh, ghost hunting game. And you kind of go into this haunted place and uh, you have to use different tools to try and figure out what type of ghost is haunting the place. And the whole time that you're doing it, you can't actually stop the ghost, but the ghost can start hunting for you and your friends. And it's one of those games where it's not super scary, but the entire time that you're playing it, you're just on edge because you don't want to be there anymore and then it's also multiplayer so i love getting my friends in there so i can play with them and laugh at them whenever they start freaking out (laughs) that is that that's not the one where there's like another multiplayer team that plays as the ghost right no um 
I know what one you're talking about because it's very similar, but I don't remember its name. Yeah, because I remember Phasmophobia was like, uh, yeah, COVID is happening and there's you can play Among Us and Fall Guys or whatever, but what if you like to be scared? Yeah, then everyone that's... started playing Phasmophobia that's... instead. That's kind of what it was. Uh, it got super big really suddenly. But it's gotten a lot better too recently. They just had an update like I want to say a week and a half ago that added in a new map called the Asylum. Mm -hmm. And it's like a really old decrepit insane asylum and there's all sorts of just scary stuff in there. And me and my friends played it last week and uh, <laughs> it was just really creepy. <laughs> That's yeah. That's that's one. If I had more friends, I'd play that game more often. It seems really fun. So as a as a boomer video game enjoyer, my my horror game enjoyment is mostly like Silent Hill, and uh, I, I'm kind of boomer kinda, video I'm, games. Boomer video games is like Pong. No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'm <laughs> in internet terms. I am a boomer. Don't worry. It's okay. Um, no, I, um, one time ago I tried to play the Fatal Frame games and, um, that's, I think I just kind of lost interest for a little bit, but, um, I'm, I'm, as people, um, may know about me, I like to, um, find retro or older games and play them in certain ways that I won't discuss here, but, uh, I recently rediscovered a, uh, a copy of Fatal Frame that was undubbed back into japanese is it's a game where you're like you're you're exploring like an old japanese like mansion and you have a camera called the camera obscura that can take pictures of ghosts and you're trying to uh exercise this house before you're um you're made into a ghost i don't know i don't remember it's been a long time but uh, i found versions of that where they took the english acting and replaced it like they modified it or whatever and so now I'm like, okay, the, this is a good time to play scary video games. So that's that's what I'm looking at on the horizon. Uh, yeah. Joe, I think the question was, what's your favorite horror stuff? Um, I I enjoy reading um, urban fantasy and uh, kind of urban horror. So like things I like things like um, the Nightside books by Simon Green or uh, so Armstrong's Other World series or the Hollows books by Kim Harrison, um, all that kind of thing. I did uh, I did read recently the Zombie Apocalypse book that uh, Shannon Coppage had uh, recommended to us that said she was she was reading. Um, and I found it to be actually surprisingly hopeful. Um, it was it was not as uh, dark or gritty as those kinds of things often are. Um, movie wise, um, I don't enjoy. In general, I don't enjoy like the slasher movies, the the constantly returning serial killer thing. I I don't watch those. I do enjoy good monster movies. Um, I have watched most vampire and werewolf uh, horror things. Um, you know, Ginger Snaps, Innocent Blood. Sometimes when I start having those conversations, my wife goes, you have terrible taste in movies. But I just ignore her and keep going. <laughs> hey, Ginger Snaps is it is what it is. Yeah, I saw Innocent Blood in the theaters. Oh yeah, and I did not expect it to become the cult classic it was. So I was just kind of like, eh, I didn't like it that much. My friend saw it was great, but I was kind of like, eh, whatever. Yeah, it uh, it has two of my favorite lines in a horror movie: one at the beginning and one at the end. Where at the beginning she says, "Why not Italian?" Uh, and at the end, when the when the cop says, uh, "If you were perfect, you wouldn't be single." relatively spoiler free 
I mean, I think I need to watch that because I'm confused now. I, I... <laughs> Actually, no, I'm thinking about Near Dark, Not Innocent Blood. Sorry. That's a completely different movie. <laughs> I, I can't tell you best lines from that movie. I um I got my wife to watch the exact same film. Only one of them was a better version of the same film. Uh, I think back to back that she had never seen before, and, and they both surprised me. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was the late '90s uh, horror schlock, uh, The Faculty. Oh yeah, that movie's so terrible, but it's uh, there's there's a charm about it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really good uh, Elijah Wood movie. A uh, really early uh, movie with him. Um, the other one, which was the exact same movie, but actually good, was The Thing. My wife had somehow never seen that. Uh, so I put both of those in front of her and I was like, okay, we're going to watch we're going to watch some uh, Body Snatcher movies. Yeah, The Faculty is Robert Rodriguez. I thought it was. It is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not great. But she was watching a bunch of like 90s schlock movies and I was like, okay, well, here's... When I think of the 90s, I'm like, I think of Goo Goo Dolls and I think of that movie. Really? I would have thought Scream would have been the big horror movie of the 90s. Uh, I don't... I mean, it is. I don't associate the 90s with pleasant memories, though. Oh, so, okay. so, <laughs> so I don't want to... I don't want to give the 90s too much credit by only talking about the stuff that I like from them, from that era. Oh, we watched Scream actually. Yeah, she um, we watched Scream for the first time as well, and um, also the lad uh, Philip Coleman, uh, who used to work here. I, he also wanted to watch Scream, so I was like, okay, all right, well, let's come over. We'll we'll cook you dinner, and you can hold our baby for a night. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we we all watched Scream for the first time, and that movie's so so insanely good. Uh, I just is that the first postmodern horror film released, Scream. No, it can't be. I don't think so. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I'm sure. Like, you can make an argument for like the Halloween movies or something yeah. like. Yeah, that, that can't be. Can't be. Horror has been around for like the, our entire culture. I got history. you, but it's the first one that made fun of horror tropes. I think. Yeah, I don't even know if that's true. I mean, because if you... Like Fearless Vampire Hunters is what you're trying to say, something like that? Well, or Transylvania 65000, okay. or uh, I mean, no, there, there there, have been movies that have, have gone, hey, horror movies are kind of dumb, aren't they? Was Dracula dead and loving it already out? Or, or Saturday the 14th. <laughs> I mean, or Love at First Bite, or Rockula. Um, Vampire's Kiss. That's the one I was thinking of. The, the Nick Cage movie. Yeah. And that was back when Nick Cage was this weird, um, like, uh, artiste, um, uh, um, actor. This, this, this back, independent back, film back actor. When? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I mean? It, instead of what he became, it was like a big, huge superstar. It was, it was this guy is kind of weird. He takes really weird, um, interesting, challenging roles. We need to keep an eye on him. Good <laughs> idea. Scream does have a uh, a um, a post watch challenge though that that I think is actually impossible to not fall for, which is stop yourself every time you're about to say, "I'm getting woozy here, man." <laughs> watch Scream and try not to say it. I, I don't know that I have. I don't know that I've ever said that. Oh, okay. I, yeah. Of course, I have also eaten a single Lay's potato chip just because I could. <laughs> All right, Kate. So let's talk about <laughs> our tabletop terror night. So um, was this... Were you involved with the planning of this, or was this something that that Zach and I had kind of talked about, and then we we talked about to the gaming club? Club. Uh, the first time around, it was mainly you guys who talked about it because 
I was brought on board as the president, I think about two weeks before it actually happened. So that was kind of like my first big thing as president for the gaming club was <clears throat> running it the first time. And I think if I remember correctly, I did get to put some input on like how we organized it and stuff and what we were going to do for like the costume contest and all that. But other than that, it was basically you and Zach. Because I know that um, the the gaming club had a, a really great insight into the kind of games that we would actually play there. Because before we were like, uh, what, what do we even do with this? And it was really taking it to the club when we got a better idea of what kind of games we could actually set up and, and how we could actually get the night going. Because before that, it was like, uh, I don't know, we got we can have swag and bring games, have pizza. But uh, yeah, after after talking to all of you there, then it became more like, here's what people know about. And here's what people actually like to play. Yeah, I think uh, that's definitely kind of what we did, too, because I know we planned out the werewolf thing for the icebreaker and then uh, we talked about doing just like some spooky board games and that's whenever we uh, brought Betrayal at the House on the Hill and uh, Betrayal at Baldur's Gate also. That's still right. Hold on. Let me see if I can finagle this right here. That's right. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I figured I'm not, I mean, when am I going to have a chance to play it at home? So I might as well keep it here. I I've been kind of thinking about just donating it to the library, but I don't know. The problem with that is it's got, it's got too many moving pieces. You don't want to donate yeah something to the library that has lots and lots of moving pieces to it yeah i actually ended up enjoying uh playing betrayal at the house on the hill so much that i went out and got my own <laughs> version of it and so i've actually played it with my friends quite a few more times after playing it at tabletop terror that's really the big thing that i i really appreciate seeing all this with just doing these kind of events where we introduce students to some kind of new thing that they can enjoy and take with them and and like have it be something that they introduce to other people who also enjoy it like that's that's a big reason why we do a lot of the stuff here like just the fun stuff is like hey we you know we have this here and it's a free event so come on in you might it might be something that you really really like yeah uh, because i think a lot of people are intimidated by the idea of getting into tabletop gaming because they see all these like super big communities who know exactly what they're doing and they have all these like really niche ideas and all these like different games and stuff and they don't know where to start or they're just like oh that's like really intense i would never be able to understand something like that mm -hmm. and i think having an event like this where you just come and like the way I explain it to people is you come, you hang out and then we'll show you how to play the games. And I promise you'll have fun playing them because they're a lot easier than you probably realize. Yeah. I think, was it um, Ego? I think who introduced Werewolf? I think so. Yeah. And that seemed, from what I read, it seemed like that game was like really, really complicated, but he like, he laid it out. He made it as this big theatrical thing to like explain what the rules of the game were and it was really cool listening to him just explain what the game was going to be like yeah that uh werewolf was also something i hadn't ever played before so listening to him explain it i was like oh cool this game's actually a lot more simple than it seems you just take turns doing all your different uh things and then once we're done with that it's the end of the round mm-hmm i think we played two rounds of it last time actually i i didn't play any of it but i seem to recall it like it was so big that everyone was just like yeah let's go let's do it again now that we actually know how this game works yeah the first round was kind of more of like a play testing round where everybody kind of realized how it worked and then we did two more actually oh. and they went a lot faster than the first round just because they everybody kind of got the gist of what they were doing well i think you also had smaller groups on the second two times i think no we know. ended up staying with the big group oh we did okay okay never mind i'm wrong you're um, thinking about when we actually broke out into yeah like, i might uh, be um 
One thing I'll bring up is uh, those of you who want to watch something really entertaining that kind of explains how board games work, there's the classic Will Wheaton series called Tabletop, which is on YouTube. You can watch a lot of classic board games. And it, it, it's um, he invites people in who are entertainers, so it's very entertaining. I've also found someone who's taken um, that template, that way of doing things, where they, they have it almost in documentary style, where they would break away and then have interviews with various players, talking to them about what they were thinking at that moment, stuff like that. And that's a group of British actors um, who do it at, at a uh, called um, No Rolls Barred. Um, it's it's also a, it's very much like tabletop in the sense that it, it's very much we're going to explain how this game works. We're going to tell jokes around it. We're all friends. We're going to stop once in a while and have somebody you know do an aside type things, talking about what they're thinking or what they're doing. Usually along those lines of I'm lying right now. I want to kill them all. You know that type of thing or. Or, or, or yes, I did do it, or something along those lines. But it, it is very entertaining. And that's something I, that people can watch. And not only does it instruct them on how to play a role playing, uh, a tabletop game, but it also is, it's, it's just entertaining to watch. Uh, I've watched a lot of stuff in there. It's like how to play this, how to play that. And they're kind of boring, honestly. Unless you're really into the game, you don't get it. This is one where it's basically people who are entertainers, they're comedians, they're, they're, they're actors. And they're trying to put on a show to some extent while having fun while playing games. Yeah, I've actually watched some of uh, No Rolls Barred before just to kind of get an idea of some of the games that I wanted to play. And they're really entertaining to watch. Yeah. And it makes it a lot easier to learn how to play a game without having to read the instructions. <laughs> Also, it makes the game seem a lot more fun. Like, if you can see how people are having fun with it. I mean, I know it's it's kind of like saying, like, ah, oh, you're emulating other people's, like, their their experiences or whatever. But, like, really seeing that other people can have fun in a certain way, it, it kind of leads, like, it kind of opens your imagination. Like, oh, I can play it like this. And, like, I can, like, I can really uh, kind of break into this game in a way that maybe this group isn't uh, so much doing. Like, it's it's a really good way of kind of expanding your own horizons for what you might not really think that you would like. Um, I know that uh, with, in terms of archiving video games, especially that's, re that's referred to as recording play. Um, the, the two ways that you can archive a game are, are just preserving the game at, as it is or preserving play. Like if you have a multiplayer game, it's almost more entertaining to watch other people play that than it is to play it yourself. And the way that like some, especially tabletop games, the rules themselves are the game, but the people playing it are also the game itself being played. So there's that extra element of what it is that you're recording in terms of preserving the like, like board games even. Mm -hmm. uncomfortable silence All right. sure. <laughs> you, you stunned us with with your your insight and and we just we didn't even know what to do with it i watched the american remake of the grudge last week why i don't know i was just imagining opening my mouth and like the cat sound coming <laughs> out you know <laughs> Okay. I, I watched about half of the ring as well and I, I just thought like man I want to watch the I, I would rather just turn on the Japanese versions of these these movies are so terrible the one I thought that the Americans did better than the Japanese version was the pulse I thought the pulse was better oh I never watched that one but did Japanese you know the American version. grudge was directed by the Japanese director of the grudge really yeah Sam Raimi produced it the original director came back like Huh. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> by by all accounts, it should not have been so terrible, but it just ended up worse. <laughs> well, I think the problem is the American version, if I remember right, I'm trying to compare the two. It's been a long time. I think the American version was like this is our protagonist. Well, mm -hmm. the Japanese was more of an anthology type thing. It's like it's a pulp fiction kind of like nonlinear story. Plus, like the the American version has the the Americanized like the loud orchestral stings. Like they they have to telegraph when things are scary. Where 
like the Japanese grudge is like like the entire soundtrack is just like a low droning hum the whole time. It's it's a really creepy movie, and they do follow one character like kind of kind of along a narrative, but it it breaks up like here's what happened to the family, and here's what happened after, and then it's like here's what happened to the daughter of a character who you see die after the main movie's narrative ends. Like it's it's really really intense and really interesting in the way that that one's told. Hmm. And then the American one has Bill Pullman. <laughs> yeah, the Ring always scared me, but not because the movie itself was super scary, but because my little sister can like bend over backwards and walk towards you like she does out of the TV. Oh, and every time that I like I watched it and then she did that to me <laughs> and it was just, oh, no, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> that's that's when you that's when you hit your little your your younger sibling and run away. Yes, <laughs> I, I have a young I have a younger step or half brother who's who's seven years younger than me. And yeah, if, if he did something like that, I would have probably shoved him and run away. Yeah, my little sister is an expert at scaring you by accident. She's just, she has like really long blonde hair and she walks silently. So every once in a while you'll go to use the bathroom in the middle of the night and you'll open up the door and she'll be stood at the end of the hall with her head like down. So her hair's <laughs> in front of her and it's terrifying. <laughs> she's She's got the, the, the poltergeist look down. Yes. If if you can ever get her to do the bit where they go in the room and she's watching the 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 white noise and the static on the screen. Yeah. She comes and goes, they're here or whatever. Like Yeah, but there's I don't think there's anything that actually has the white noise static anymore. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. That would be creepier actually. An HD TV that was still producing static. That's like I, w I was just going to say if you could just get like a, because it doesn't have to work or anything, you could get one for like $5 or something from you know, Goodwill, just get an old boxy style television, take all the guts out of it, and then actually film her crawling out of the TV. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> I was actually going to say that those TVs are super valuable for uh, old, like competitive video games because of the input lag. Yeah. Actually, there. what you want to do, I'm just thinking about that. What you want to do is actually have the screen a little bit smaller on the on the on the on the on the uh, flat screen TV you put into that. So when it, when the hand comes out, it looks like the hand is actually coming out of the out of the screen completely. Yes. There you go. <laughs> yeah. We'll just make our own movies. <laughs> Who needs movies anymore? We just make our own. <sighs> Ryan, are there any new horror movies that you've seen? That Well, any that you have been recently made aware of that you might have not known about before since the last time I asked you? Um, five years ago, I did a class with Peter Fields on uh, weird fiction. And we have been working this year to possibly do a new version of that, focusing on the new weird. New weird. And one of the great new weird books slash movies that's come out in recent years is Annihilation. Would you, would you have them read the books as well? Um, what we're doing for it is there was a collection put out um, 10 years ago called uh, The New Weird. Hmm. Or a recent Cthulhu, uh, no, New Cthulhu, The Recent Weird, something along those lines. And it's a collection of short stories, and that's what we're going to focus on because we want to focus on the short stories. We don't want to focus on the on the novels and other novellas. Although um, Peter's also thinking about possibly doing uh, Lovecraft Country as well, but I think I'm going to try to convince him to stick to the short stories. Um, that's what we did originally in the class when we focused just on the you know the hundred year old stories, and I think that's what we should focus on even if we're focusing on the new stuff is to focus on the short stories really. Hmm. Okay. So yes, new weird, new weirds out there. Hmm. 
<clears throat> yeah, because I had, I had mentioned I wanted to talk about some video games that I think um, land firmly in the the weird fiction category. I think that's a that's something that there's no reason why it's not spoken about academically, but it's just like people have to know. You as know, far like, as I know, we're one of the few people out there that actually did a class on weird fiction. And it was basically, Peter was trying to figure out if you could do a class on it. And it turns out, yeah, you can. You can. There's a lot of deep analysis to it. Um, it says more, I think, about the author than it does about the genre itself, though, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I guess it's like, that's. did weird fiction fall out of favor for a time or something? It was considered a junk for a longest for the longest time. Uh, love, especially Lovecraft stuff, was considered a Cthulhu. The Cthulhu Mythos overall was considered kind of junk, um, campy type pulp fiction type stuff. It, it, it. I, I remember I when I was actually in college as an undergraduate, I did a paper on H.P. Lovecraft, and the only academic sources I could find were in French. Actually, I had to find tra French translations of the papers. Those are the only people doing academic scholarship. Nowadays, everybody's doing scholarship on 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 weird fiction. It, it is a well, it's it, and it's more popular now than I think it's ever been, even during the nineteen thirties um, and during its heyday. Yeah, I I can see that. I mean, it's it just with the internet, everyone has access to everything now, so it's hard for things to be niche anymore. Yeah, it's also even, so hard. Sorry, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Even niche things, you can find a decent sized group usually on the internet for something that there you might be the only person in like your whole city who does this thing. You're still going to be able to find like ten thousand other people who do it on the internet. Well, I think the reverse is also true. It's hard to find something that's a shared touchstone experience for everyone nowadays, too, to some extent. I mean, speaking of someone who had three channels on the television set, wasn't that hard to do back in the day? Sorry, four. There was well, PBS as well. I I might actually disagree because you see a lot of like the big Netflix shows, like or or maybe the big whatever streaming shows, like they'll get like really highly focused, uh, like audiences for a little bit at the very least like when stranger things came out like everyone was talking about stranger things even though it was uh, netflix six or seven years ago or whatever yeah but i honestly i've never seen a single episode tell you the truth and i think that's more common than you think it is um, chris i think i mean it's it's not like the like the day after would be the big film experience that, of my generation where basically everybody watched it do you remember what is that what was that the 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 something blue the blue blue bird blue something bird bird box oh bird yeah, box. Box. That, it, that got like 300 million viewers i've never seen it but people have <laughs> like the well, day the, after it came out the on difference Netflix, is though like, also the fact is um you know there's a difference between 300 million americans and 300 million people worldwide oh sure have seen something you know yeah so. sure absolutely that's why JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is currently the cultural touchstone of the entire world right now. Once again, I'm not I have to actually take it back. I have watched the first two episodes, was not interested to stop watching. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is a Lovecraft. No, no. <laughs> actually, everything nowadays at least has some Lovecraft somewhere usually. Yeah, people like the unknown. People like the 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 fear of the the mysterious and the the unknowable. Like, well, I'll give you a gift for all those people who are listening that might actually take my class in a year or two years from now. Uh, the secret of 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 weird fiction is not the great Lovecraft quote that you know the greatest emotion is fear and the greatest all fears is fear of the unknown. The most weird fiction goes with the idea that what people are most afraid of is the fact that we don't know anything, especially about ourselves. That, would I'd say, is the summation of what the weird is actually about. It's the fear of not knowing something, especially about yourself. I don't know that that's true. <laughs> I'm going to argue with you, just because I can. 
I got you. I'm just saying that's usually the theme. You can disagree with me. That's usually the theme of a weird fiction story, though, is fear of not knowing something. The fear of not knowing something or being wrong about something. Or the yeah. fear that everything you know is wrong, basically. Especially yeah. about yourself. Um, I was... I follow online various um, people, organizations, whatever, that do uh, writing quotes and writing prompts and things like that. And I read this thing that I thought was really sort of brilliant. Um, it was talking about that um, the difference between what kids are afraid of and what adults are afraid of um and basically i i won't quote it but basically it said uh kids are afraid of the dark uh adults are afraid of what they see in the mirror and what they know is behind it not the mirror but you know the reflection yeah. in the mirror yeah yeah, yeah because like so what, what, so because what so people Cthulhu, are afraid what you're saying is Cthulhu. We're afraid of Cthulhu. <laughs> well, I, no, it's it's that it's that like we we are we know, and and like maybe we're not. We won't admit it. You know, maybe we won't admit it, but we know what horrible monsters we are inside our heads. So so uh, what we're afraid of are the things that we know we have lurking in the back corners of our mind. We're, we're afraid of, of rage and hatred and a lack of empathy um, and just, you know, wanton violence or, you know, whatever. Uh, all, the, all the dark secrets that we try to make sure that no one ever sheds a light on inside our own minds. Um, so, you know, kids are afraid of the dark because they're innocent and they don't, you know, they, they, they don't have anything to be afraid of when they look in the mirror. Oh, uh, I'd and, argue and that kids do. are innocent. I would argue, as someone who got the shit beat out of them since, since elementary well, school. Well, okay, kid, kid here being a loose term where in the innocence is implied in their status. Okay, because like I have known fairly young people um i'm trying to think of what the youngest maybe as young as 10 i don't think any younger than that but i have known people who at, as as young as 10 uh had already experienced more trauma more horror than a lot of adults my age have um and so the the age the age is not necessarily you know the primary uh, determiner of what you've 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 gone through in in your life, uh, but I mean I've I've known fabulously mature fourteen years old, and 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 fabulously horrifically immature fifty sixty year olds. So you know, it's it's not about <laughs> it's 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 not the age; it's the mileage. <laughs> Well, that was dark. It's the Halloween episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but can we talk about Ab Abbott and Costello meet the mummy or something? I mean, come on. <laughs> no, no. No. Um, no. Well, actually, um, I was going to say that, yeah, let's go with that direction. But we have been on for about an hour. Yeah. And I know Kate's got a lot of stuff to do. It's, it's the fact that You've been on here for this long, talking to a bunch of old chunks of coal like us for this long is is probably very, very draining. So I'm going to go ahead and say that we move on to our our last little chunks of of stuff and discussion here. Okay, and that's you, Joe. Uh, what's going oh, okay. on? Okay, all right. Stuff stuff happening soonish. Uh, end of October, going into the first part of uh, November. Uh, Wichita Falls Museum of Art uh, here at MSU Texas is hosting an opening reception and panel discussion for the exhibition From Boom to Bust, Modernism, Regionalism, and Social Realism. That's uh, on October 20th from 5 to 7.30. Uh, also on October 20th, uh, Department of Music is presenting 
uh, Prayers for a Feverish Planet, New Music About Climate Change. Uh, on October 27th, the campus is doing the Trunk or Treat uh, in the Coliseum parking lot. Uh, also on the 27th, De uh, Department of Music is hosting a Bratwurst dinner uh, at 6.30, followed by Oktoberfest. Uh, then on Tuesday, November 1st, Department of Music at the First United Methodist Church uh, is doing a choir uh, a performance of Mozart's Requiem. Uh, Mosaic Cross Cultural Center is hosting critical conversation series on mitigating unconscious bias uh, in the Clark Student Center on November 2nd. Uh, music department doing wind ensemble and orchestra Thursday, November 3rd. Uh, we are going to be doing our book plating ceremony honoring faculty that have been tenured on November 8th. Uh, music department doing percussion ensemble. Music department's got a bunch of stuff going on. Uh, <laughs> Tuesday, November 8th in Aiken Auditorium. At the MPEC, uh, they're doing Hangar Holiday on November 12th. Uh, let's see. And us here, uh, our November podcast, will be talking with uh, Kim Gordon about local community theater. Okay, I guess we're going to wrap it up. Uh, if anyone has any questions, they can contact us at at library at msutexas.edu. And Kate, was there anything you wanted to mention? Anything you wanted to plug or anything be before we steamroll you and keep talking? <laughs> no, not really. I just wanted to say thanks for having me on, uh, despite what you think. I actually really enjoyed listening to this because I personally love podcasts and there were some really interesting conversations today. So where can, if I wanted to sign up for the gaming club, where can I go? Uh, if you wanted to sign up for the gaming club, you could find us on Mustang's link and you just have to search Stains Gaming Club and there is a form that you can fill out to get into the club. And once you do that, you can, well, you get an invite to the Discord and that's where most of our stuff happens. Yeah, Discord's really fun. It's very, it's a very warm and inviting community there. I, I wish that I had more time to actually go in and, and read what everyone says and talk and everything. But yeah, it's... that's all. That's all you students. That's that's your game, not mine. <laughs> it's really fun. So the tabletop terror that will be on the twenty first starts at seven p.m. Uh, if you're listening, we really hope to see you there. It's going to be a whole lot of fun yeah we're gonna have all sorts of stuff to do this year and also wear a costume because we'll have a costume contest that has a prize cool awesome that's gonna be really fun all right so from all of us here at the library i'm chris and joe i'm ryan this is cthulhu there's cthulhu <laughs> there <he> is. <laughs> and uh yeah i guess that'll be it for me all right happy halloween everyone all right, happy Halloween. We're out. Happy Halloween.